It's good to see all of you this evening as we gather together for worship. And let me begin with just a few words from Paul's letter to the Ephesians and the first chapter. Paul says this in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're going to begin our worship by turning to hymn number 118, 118, this lovely Christ-centered hymn, Name of all majesty, fathomless mystery, King of the ages by angels adored, 118. Thank you. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you on this Sabbath evening. We find ourselves in this place of worship and we thank you for the privilege that is ours to enter into the courts of our God and to do so with songs of praise. And Father, we thank you particularly of him who, of whom we have been singing. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the glory of who the Savior is. We thank you that he is your only begotten son. We thank you that he is the second person of the Trinity. And we thank you that by grace, he is our savior this evening. 
Lord, such was our lost estate that it was necessary for your son to come. It was necessary for your son to take our nature. It was necessary for your son to go to Calvary's cross to deal with our sin. But Father, we thank you that in Christ we have a mighty Savior. We thank you that in Christ we have a victorious Savior. And we thank you, to the Lord, that this evening we can sing of a Savior who has triumphed over every foe. We thank you that everything that you gave to your Son to accomplish, he has accomplished it with power and glory. And so, dear Lord, we pray that you would help us this evening to delight in Jesus and to give him all the glory and praise. Father, just bless us in every aspect of our worship this evening. And may we know something of heaven coming down. May we know something of being lifted up into the heavenly realm. May we know what it is to meet with our glorious God this evening. Cleanse us from sin, we pray. Empower us by the Spirit, because we ask all of these things in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Well, again, welcome in the Savior's name. It's good to see you as we gather together for worship. Uh, no particular change with regard to the uh, notices that were given this morning. On Tuesday evening at quarter to seven, we'll be having the Trailblazers meeting. Uh, it's the last of the ordinary meeting because in two weeks' time, uh, we'll be having a, a Lego fest. So uh, please do remember the youngsters as they gather together uh, on Tuesday evening. Then on Wednesday at 8 p.m., uh, we've got our regular midweek meeting for Bible study and prayer. Last week, we started a new short series on the life of Elijah, and we'll be continuing that uh, this coming Wednesday. Then next Lord's Day, half past 10, Sunday school, Bible classes, and the services at the usual time of 11.30 and 7. Please do remember the leaflets for the Easter mission. It's hard to believe that Easter is only two weeks away, uh, but please do take the invitations, hand them out to family and friends, and encourage folk to come along on the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of Easter week. Those are all the announcements in the will of the Lord. Uh, we're going to turn to our next item of praise, which is number 582. It's in the hymn section, but it's actually the old metrical version of Psalm 40. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. 582.
If you have a Bible, please turn with me uh, to Paul's letter to the Ephesians and to the second chapter. We're going to read from verse 1 uh, through to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1 through to verse 10. Let us hear the word of God. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that your word has reminded us this evening of your amazing grace. We thank you for that amazing grace that you display towards lost men and women and boys and girls. We thank you that even before the world was, you purpose to save a people for yourself. And seeing our lost estate, you sent your son into this world to do that which we could not do. We thank you, loving Heavenly Father, that in Jesus Christ, you have granted to us the perfect Savior, the Savior who meets our every need. And Father, we thank you that even when we were dead spiritually, your heart was filled with love and compassion towards us. And we thank you for every providence you use in our lives to bring us under the sound of the gospel. We thank you, dear Lord, for everyone who prayed for us, for everyone who spoke to us of Christ. But Father, most of all, we thank you for that moment in our lives when the Spirit broke into our hearts and the light of the gospel shone into the darkest recesses of our being. We thank you to the Lord our God that you brought us to that point when we understood ourselves and when we understood Christ. We thank you for that time when we saw just how lost we were. But also we thank you for that moment when we saw Christ as the perfect Savior who meets our every need. Lord, we thank you that at that moment we fell in love with Christ and we've experienced his saving power in our lives. And Lord, we thank you that it is Christ who saved us and it is Christ who upholds us throughout the Christian life. And it is Christ 
who will bring us safely home to glory. Father, we thank you for your many, many mercies to us as a congregation. We thank you for being with us this morning, and we thank you for our brother Simon, who was able to speak to us. We pray, O oh Lord our God, that what he said would be blessed to our hearts, and O Lord, that you would give us an ever-increasing confidence in your word. And especially, the Lord, as we are bombarded with views that are contrary to Scripture, we pray, the Lord, that we would stand on the solid ground of your word. And, the Lord, our God, we pray for that world in which we live, a world which is so often marked by darkness. Lord, we pray that you would help us as your people to proclaim the light of the gospel. And dear Lord, we pray that you would work graciously in the hearts and minds of those who are present, do not know the Savior. Father, we do pray for our families this evening. We thank you for our loved ones, but we pray especially for those who are outside of Christ this evening. We pray that you would have mercy upon them just as you had mercy upon us and that you would grant us that immense joy of seeing loved ones coming to faith in Christ. Father, we thank you for your mercies in the life of uh, Jack and Alice. We thank you to the Lord that Jack is now home, and we pray that your blessing would continue to rest upon him as he uh, recovers. And Lord, we pray that every day that he would know increased strength, and that every day he would know your grace in his life. Father, we pray for Jim in hospital this evening, and we pray that you would bless him, that he would know something of your presence there in the hospital ward. And we pray to Lord our God that you would encourage him and Irene in every way. And Father, we pray for those other members of the congregation who through infirmity of body cannot be with us this evening. Bless them in abundance, we pray, and do them good. And Father, we pray for our young folk. We thank you for them. We thank you for the blessing that they are. And we just ask, O oh Lord, that you would ground them in the truths of Scripture whilst they are young. We pray that you would work graciously in their hearts while they are still tender. And we pray, O oh Lord, that our young folk would live their lives to your honor and to your glory. We pray to that end that you would bless trailblazers and the Sunday school. We thank you for the gathering meeting that took place yesterday evening and for the teenagers that were here. Lord, for all of the young folk, have mercy upon them, we pray, and bless them in every way. Father, we pray this evening for the wider cause of Christ, and we especially remember the Christian Institute this evening. We thank you for uh, that uh, organization and for the blessing that it has been. But Father, as they go through this period of mourning, we pray that you would comfort them and encourage them. And Lord, we pray that the work would continue and would go from strength to strength. We thank you for the blessing that it has been in the past and for the way in which you have used it for uh, the cause of the Savior. But Lord, we pray that you would bless them in a very special way this evening. Father, just continue to be with us as we worship and bless us particularly as we turn to your word later on. Lord, speak to us, we pray, because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you'll be able to see from the screen later on, we'll be thinking uh, about the life of St. Patrick and the hymn that we're going to sing uh, now, uh, hymn number 443, in many ways reflects uh, Patrick's own life. Uh, he went far from the Lord before he was brought to know and love the Savior. And we're going to sing 443, 
I was a wandering sheep. I did not love the fold. 443. Thank you. Over 1,500 years ago, a man died on the 17th of March and was probably, possibly buried in Downpatrick. The world that he left behind, the island that he left behind, was a very different place, a better place because of this man. Now, the man in question is, of course, Patrick. And you will know that today is commonly known as St. Patrick's Day. You will also be aware that there is a lot of nonsense that takes place on this day, both here and abroad. There are rivers that are painted green. There is beer that is green. Even in our own town, earlier this afternoon, there was a parade about which the organizers said that visitors would be able to revel in a selection of cultural music, dance, family parade, and entertainment. What any of that has got to do with Patrick is your guess as good as mine. But it's an example of the kind of thing that takes place at this time of the year. 
But the question, friends, that I want us to think about this evening is who was the real Patrick? Who was the real Patrick? When you strip away all the nonsense, who was this man? And what did he actually do? Is this someone that we should remember? Is this someone for whom we should be thankful? Well, this evening, we're going to think about Patrick. And I appreciate it's something a little out of the ordinary. We don't normally do something like this on a Sunday, but hopefully it will be of help to us. Now, it has to be said that a lot of mythology has grown up around him. But when you read Patrick himself, and there are a few documents that we know that Patrick wrote, when you read Patrick himself, you find that he is a very different man from what is popularly portrayed, particularly at this time of the year. What you find when you listen to Patrick himself is that he's very different from the nonsense, very different from the mythology, very different from many people's idea of who he was. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to think about Patrick and we're going to look at him through the lens of the gospel. And to do that, we're going to think about Patrick in four phases or four periods of his life. We're going to think about privilege. We're going to think about slavery. We're going to think about salvation. And we're going to think about service. Privilege, slavery, salvation, and service. So firstly, we need to think about privilege. Uh, we were all born somewhere, uh, and Patrick tells us in his confession where he was born and where he grew up. The only problem is the place that he mentions has been lost in the mists of history. But what is clear is that Patrick was not an Irishman, that Patrick was born in Britain. And he was born towards the end of the Roman period. And he was born into relatively comfortable circumstances in the 5th century. His father was a landowner and a local Roman official. Uh, his father was a member of the local council and was responsible for the collection of imperial taxes. So by the standards of the day, Patrick's childhood experience was a privileged one. But there was another privilege that Patrick enjoyed. Not only was he born into a materially wealthy family, but he was also privileged to be born into a believing family. His father was a deacon, and his grandfather had been a presbyter, a minister. Uh, we should note in passing that both of these men held office in the church, even though they were married men. You see, the celibacy of later Catholicism belonged to a far later period and not to the period in which uh, Patrick lived. But he was born into a believing home. But despite those privileges, despite being born into a believing home, Patrick didn't heed Solomon's wisdom. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Do you 
you remember Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1? Solomon says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Patrick would later write of his childhood that these were years marked by idleness and unbelief. He was taught the essentials of the faith, but there was no seeking after God. There was no heart religion. There was no work of grace within. You see, friends, it's possible to be born into the most privileged of circumstances spiritually and yet to be a stranger to grace. I wonder whether that would be a fair description of anyone here this evening. You've been born into a believing home. You're well versed in the scriptures. You're familiar with the, the, the essentials of the faith. But there is a disconnect between what you know intellectually and your heart. There is no desire for, no seeking after God in Christ. That was Patrick. I wonder whether it's you. So we have privilege. Patrick was born into a privileged home, both materially and spiritually. But he doesn't seem to have appreciated either. He doesn't seem to have appreciated the material wealth of his home, and he certainly doesn't seem to have appreciated the spiritual blessings of his home. So the second period that we need to think about this evening is the period of slavery. It's very interesting that Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 seems to have been played out in Patrick's life. He didn't remember his creator in the days of his youth. And evil days did come. When he was 16, Irish raiders kidnapped him and took him back to Ireland, where they sold him into slavery. Now just imagine the change in circumstances. Uh, you're, you've grown up in the orderly world of Rome. Your father is a man of note in that world. You live in a Roman villa. There are servants to tend to your every need. You live in a home that is sanctified by the gospel. But then you're torn away from it all. You're carried off to a barbarous, lawless, pagan land. And now you're at the bottom of the pile. You are someone else's property. We're not exactly sure how long it took Patrick, but having been sold into slavery, he eventually ended up in the area of Slemish Mountain. And there, he was given the task of herding his master's sheep and cattle. And we can be in no doubt that in the shadow of Slemish, Patrick shed many a tear. Perhaps he even climbed that mountain and looked in the direction of home and thought about the privileges that once were his, the privileges that he once enjoyed. Certainly we can be sure that this was all part of God's plan in Patrick's life. And it is interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how different people's experience of grace can be. There are those who are converted 
with just a gentle kiss of the gospel. They hear it, and there's no struggle, there's no fighting. Their heart is just overwhelmed by grace there and then. But with others, it's different. With some, they have to be led down very dark and very dangerous paths first. I think it was the evangelist John Blanchard who once said, God sometimes puts us in the dark to show us that he is the light. In some respects, that was true of Jacob, isn't it? I'm always struck by his example. Jacob was born into a believing home. He would have heard from Abraham, his grandfather, about God's gracious dealings with him. He would have heard similar stories from Isaac. He had received the sign of the covenant. Jacob enjoyed so many spiritual privileges. And yet it was only when he had left that believing home that God began to speak to him. And he would spend many a year in a distant land, far from home, being dealt with by God, so that eventually when he did return, he would be a very different man from the one who left. And something similar seems to have happened to Patrick. Like the prodigal, He had to go to the far country to come to his senses. He had to be brought to the darkness of pagan island in order to see the light of the believing home that he left behind. The believing home that he had taken so much for granted. It gives us hope, doesn't it? It gives us hope this evening for those of our loved ones who are far from home. Whether they are half far from home physically or metaphorically. Perhaps the very reason why they are so far from home is because God had to take them to a dark and distant land before they would begin to see the light that shone in their home. Patrick enjoyed great privileges in his youth, but he was torn away from those privileges and ended up as a slave in pagan island. The third period we need to think about is salvation. Now, some of you here will remember the story of John Newton that we thought about uh, not so long ago, uh, who despite enjoying great privileges as a child, remember he had a very godly uh, Christian mother who taught him uh, the essentials of the gospel, but Newton went far away from God. But do you remember that it was after many hardships It was after many hardships that God met with Newton in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And something similar happens to Patrick. God meets with him when he is at his lowest ebb. He may have been born in Britain, But Patrick was born again in Ireland as he tended his master's sheep and cattle in the shadow of Slemish. He began to ponder those things that he had previously given little thought to. He began to ponder those gospel truths that had had so little impact upon him at home. 
And those gospel truths began to weigh heavily upon his mind and heart. About that time, uh, Patrick said this. He said, I knew not the true God. I was carried into captivity into Ireland. And there the Lord opened my sense of unbelief that even though I late should remember my sins and be converted with my whole heart unto the Lord my God. That should encourage every parent and every Sunday school teacher here this evening. Remember, in Ireland, Patrick had no teacher, no counselor, no spiritual guide, no minister to help him. All he had were those truths that he had learned in his childhood. All he had are those truths that he had been taught in his childhood but had seemed to have no impact upon him at the time at all. But then far from home, in a dark land, on the slopes of Slamish, the Holy Spirit was able to awaken those truths in Patrick's heart and give him a growing sense of his own sinfulness. And there, as the light finally began to dawn upon his soul, Patrick began to seek after God. He began to pray. I wonder what his parents were thinking at the time that all of this was happening. They didn't know what had happened to their son. They didn't know where their son was, as far as we're aware. Perhaps they thought that their son was lost to them forever. And yet, far from home, God was bringing their son to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The seed had been sown in the home, but the seed was watered far from home in a distant land where there were no outward encouragements whatsoever. No one to counsel, no one to help, only the Spirit of God working in his heart. And one of the interesting things about Patrick, when you read what he wrote himself, is that there is a complete absence of those doctrines that would become so central to medieval Catholicism in later centuries. When you read Patrick himself, you find that his theology is Trinitarian. It is Christ-centered, and it is biblical. It's clear when you read uh, Patrick himself that Patrick is very much aware of his sin and very much aware that salvation is utterly of the Lord. And one of the things that he wrote, he said this, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of Christ. May your salvation, Lord, be always with me. Now, that doesn't mean that Patrick got everything right. That doesn't mean that the Celtic church of which Patrick was part got everything right. They didn't. But what is clear is this, that Patrick's gospel was a gospel of grace. That Patrick understood 
that a man or a woman or a boy or a girl is not saved through faith and works. He understood that salvation was utterly of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Patrick's gospel was a Christ-centered gospel where God in grace saves those who cannot save themselves. Privilege, slavery, salvation, and fourthly, service. Patrick was a slave here in Ireland for six years. And after six years, he was able to escape and he made his way to the coast and he caught a ship for home. Now just imagine that moment when his parents, who were still alive when he returned, just imagine that moment when they heard a knock at the door. They probably didn't give it a second thought, and it certainly never crossed their mind that that knock at the door would be their long lost son. He had been gone for such a long time. When he left them, he was just a teenager, but when now he was a man. But when you think about Patrick, in, in some respects, it reminds you of, of Philemon receiving Onesimus back. Because when Patrick's parents received their son back, they weren't simply receiving their son back. They weren't simply receiving a man, a fully grown man back. They were receiving a brother in Christ back. Do you remember that was the case with Onesimus? Onesimus had been a servant of uh, Philemon and he had gone on the run, but when he uh, met the Apostle Paul in Rome, he came to know and love the Savior, and Paul sent Onesimus back home, and he said to Philemon, you're receiving him back, yes, as a slave, but more than as a slave, as a brother in Christ. And that was the case for Patrick's parents. Yes, their son had returned. But their son was a different man. Their son was a believing man. And how they must have rejoiced. And what a story Patrick had to tell. But he didn't stay at home for long. He would go eventually to France in order to study. And he felt the call of God to return to Ireland. It's remarkable, isn't it, when you think about it? Remarkable when you consider everything that he suffered as a slave in Ireland, that Patrick should have compassion on the pagan Irish. But it's a further evidence of God's gracious dealings with Patrick. Now, later, Catholic writers tell, say that, that Patrick returned to Ireland at the behest of the Bishop of Rome. But there's actually no evidence for that whatsoever. In fact, modern Catholic historians tell us that Patrick was sent by the church in Britain and that it was his own idea to return. And in many ways, when he did return, he conducted what we would call an itinerant ministry, going from place to place, preaching the gospel. And as people were converted and churches were established, we're told that Patrick uh, ordained bishops in every individual congregation. There were no diocesan bishops in Patrick's day. Those would come over 600 years later when the Roman church sought to impose its will upon Ireland with an English army uh, at its behest. But Patrick himself went from place to place preaching the gospel. 
He later said with regard to that period of his life that God was especially gracious and that through his ministry, thousands of people were born again of the Spirit of God and came to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Hundreds of churches were established by Patrick. Thousands were brought into the kingdom. Eventually he would die, either in four, the 460s or the 490s, we're not exactly sure. But is Patrick someone that we should remember? Is he someone for whom we should be thankful? The answer is yes. Because when he is stripped of the mythology, when he is stripped of all the nonsense that has grown up around him, you find that his is a story of sovereign grace. And that his is a story that modern Ireland needs to hear. The message that he proclaimed 1,500 years ago is the same message that men and women and boys and girls desperately need to hear in our own day. A message where God breaks in to the lives of men and women and boys and girls who are lost in sin and graciously saves them and brings them to a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Should we remember Patrick? Yes. Should we be thankful for Patrick? Yes. But make sure that the Patrick that we're thankful for and the Patrick that we remember is the real Patrick, the true Patrick, and not the Patrick of mythology. Let's pray. <laughs> Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of grace and we thank you for the grace that you displayed in the life of Patrick so many centuries ago. We thank you that though he took for granted the privileges that he enjoyed, yet, O oh Lord our God, you broke into his life and brought him not simply to see his sin but to see the remedy to his sin in the person of Jesus. Father, we thank you that his life was transformed through a living faith in the Savior. And we thank you for all that you did through him to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ. And Father, as we seek to live for you in this present day and generation, we pray to the Lord that we would declare the same message of grace to a dying world. That we would go out into the highways and byways and that we would speak to men and women and boys and girls and to tell them about the only one who can save them, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we would live to see better days, glorious days, when men and women are transformed by the gospel. Father, we ask all of these things in the lovely name of our Saviour. Amen. We're going to sing in closing hymn 529. In 529, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, nor else to me say that thou art. 529.
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.